Let's see what the stew has for us today. Welcome to the Gnomecast, the Gnome Stew's tabletop gaming advice podcast. Here we talk with the other gnomes about gaming things to avoid becoming part of the stew, so I guess we'd better be good. Today we have a little bit of a special break here. Instead of Angie, you have me, Jared, the review gnome, and I'll be doing an interview for you today. Capers, a superpowered game of gangsters in the Roaring Twenties. With this game, you get to play criminals or cops during the Prohibition era, but with superpowers. Do you build a criminal empire or bring the bootleggers down? The Kickstarter for the deluxe hardcover launched on January 7th. A gorgeous 164-page book, 8.5 by 11, hardcover with Smythe's own binding that is sturdy and will allow the book to lay flat while open. Glossy full-cover interior and two ribbon bookmarks to help keep track of the information you need for your game. There are backer tiers for getting the deluxe hardcover with all the support PDFs, or if you want, just the book or just the PDF. Head on over to Kickstarter now to become a backer for Capers. Today on the Gnomecast, we're bringing you an interview with the designer of the Demihumans RPG. Would you like to introduce yourself for the Gnomecast listeners? Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Bull. And uh, what might people know you from in the RPG hobby? Probably the, the single way most people in the world know of me is if they watch Tabletop with Will Wheaton. They played my game, uh, Misspent Youth, with uh, Matt Fraction, Kelly DeConnick, and, um, uh, and Amy Dallin uh, with Will Wheaton GMing. So that was really cool. And so Misspent Youth is a teenage rebellion in a, in a dystopian future game. Oh, I should ask, can I, how, should I watch my language? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Gnome cast is usually a PG-13 uh, <laughs> or lower. <laughs> Right. So, so uh, I won't give the real subtitle to the game, but the idea is that it's about teenagers in the future stopping a dystopian future. Um, and then the other sort of notable thing I've done is I was the 2016 Game Chef English language winner for Beyond Our Walls, which is uh, in, in some ways kind of like a precursor to, to this game in that the language, uh, to the game we're discussing today, Demi Humans, in that the language is very specific i wouldn't call it quite as flowery as uh, as demi humans is but it's i was basically adopting some of the language rules from the, the spartacus tv show <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and, and like <laughs> just trying to 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 produce a, a, a i can't seem to not write in voice so, um, <laughs> so that's what i was doing there what's interesting is i actually watched that episode of tabletop and i completely blanked that that was your game because <laughs> i remember that one yeah they even got art from the cover artist it was great <laughs> Would you like to tell us what Demi Humans is about? Sure. So it's like a apocalypse world game where the apocalypse is sort of in the middle of happening and it's the death of magic and thus magical people. Uh, it's also sort of the um, elven alien age game from like Dragon Age or like uh, it's Tolkien's, you know, man's age where the halflings are all getting taller and, and, and the elves are all leaving and, and that kind of stuff. So the idea is that you are telling the story of a non-human enclave, a neighborhood or ghetto or a municipality or sector or whatever in a human city. So long ago, there was a war between uh, orcs and humans trying to uh, genocide each other, and the humans won. And so now, in, in, in doing so, they broke magic, so everything's sort of falling apart. And it's about those people in the face of what seems like certain doom trying to build a community and, and live their lives all right what is your history with uh powered by the apocalypse games i'm actually proud to say i was in a pre-publication play test with vincent nice um because I, I i was lucky enough to live in his area as he was developing the game so yeah i i played a bit in that and then i played a few sort of pbta games and sessions mostly just as one-offs after that except for I did a long con once. And, um, but actually where, I've, where I really, really like came to understand PBTA design is in, is in writing this game. And because well, the way I wrote this game initially was to take the Apocalypse World 2 text and just rewrite it as my game, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, in the, in the samurai sword folding over and over again way that you do when you were creating a game, it eventually there's very few words or even structures that are, are, are linguistic structures that are that similar to the original book. But I, I, I 
I certainly came to understand Apocalypse World very well, or at least the parts that I'm stealing, which is ninety like percent <laughs> of it. What do you think about Power by the Apocalypse games appealed to you to use that as the framework that you built on? Honestly, the initial idea was like Apocalypse World uh, fantasy. What would that be? And specifically the apocalypse part because there's you know dungeon world which is like fantasy using powered by the apocalypse but i i always wondered what you know it, it actually i think initially vincent was a long time ago was talking about the dragon killers i think is what it was called or the dragon hunters um and that was gonna be his like apocalypse the 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 I, I think like a, dra- a dragon had just died or something and, and like that was going to end the world or the, the world uh, had ended previously. Anyway, I think he never actually wound up making that and then instead created like Fallen Empires, uh, which is like the, the fantasy hack, but it's mm-hmm. not, it doesn't seem as heavy on the, uh, it's sort of like a historical fiction Middle Ages thing as opposed to, to me to being like a like a like an apocalypse thing. Yeah. Right, right, and, and also because uh, you know when I uh, the idea to make it a community based game is largely came out of my noticing that you could take the hard holder and give that the hard holders moves to everybody mm-hmm. and thereby create a community game. So I am going to um, satisfy my own curiosity here because I've played a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games. But I have not. Uh, um, a lot of them have been like uh, second and third generation games. So I haven't played a lot of games that use stat highlighting for advancement. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if I could pick your brain on why that appealed to you to use that particular means of advancement. And for anybody that hasn't played a Power of the Apocalypse game that uses stat highlighting, could you explain that a little bit for, for people? Sure. So, the, I mean, a lot of the answers to why I did this are that it is a hack of Apocalypse World per se. And so a lot of times I'm like, well, does this, this is an apocalypse world. Does it work in my game? And if it does, it stays. Mm-hmm. Uh, but specifically why I've always liked that, it, it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite things from one of my favorite games, Primetime Adventures, where there's the fan mail system, where when someone does something you like, you give them a point from this common pool uh, that needs to be given out. Mm-hmm. And so it's a way to directly signal people what you, what you like and what you want to see more of. And that's really uh, what I like about it. And it seems sort of uh, Apocalypse World is not an antagonistic per se between the characters, but it, it certainly has that rep. And it, so it's interesting to me that there's that phase where it's like, I want to see this from you. Right. And that, that's really important to me. And I, I also feel like the step of the Demiurge, which is the, the MC like role in this game, the step of the Demiurge selecting something really helps with one of the the principles, which is, you know, make, make the characters your heroes because you're having to say all the time, well, I want to make sure you do well, so I'm going to give you the high plus or like everyone's already taking your good stats. I'm going to pick the stat that I love about you or that I'd love to see you. Like it, it gives the the Demiurge an opportunity to be a fan as, as well in a very concrete way and to remind them, hey, you're a fan at the start of every session. All right. Speaking of mechanics that I have seen in other games and that are a little bit different in this, when I was reading the intimacy moves, those kind of jumped out at me because I'm used to either Apocalypse World or say like Urban Shadows has, you know, when you share something intimate with someone else. These actually read a little bit different. Would you care to go into how the intimacy moves work in Demi Humans? Yeah. So one of the key things in this game is about identi- uh, about describing the culture of your people. And I'll say, by the way, that the game does not use the word race ever. It might use the word racist a few times, but uh, it all only ever uses the mm-hmm. word people. Because honestly, I think we get into some unfortunate circumstances using using that word, especially for people that are so different from one, much more different from one another than real humans are. Yeah, definitely. And then also you get uncomfortable things like a book called, you know, hidden talents of the dark races or something and it's just like makes us look terrible yeah Uh, definitely so anyway one of the key features of this is is of the game the purposes of the game is to identify what elven culture is what gnomish culture is and so the intimacy move is about intimately sharing culture with someone so you sit down one-on-one with the, the example i gave in the book 
is this elf is taking his friend's daughter through the pre-dawn woods and picking out a salad of uh, petals and uh, flower petals and grubs like his mother's used to make uh, with him. So the idea there is, you know, that's a, that's an intimate moment between two people. It's sharing something that the elf culture did or does. And you, it can also be sex, like intimately sharing culture. The culture that you're sharing could be, this is how we reproduce mm-hmm. um, or, or, or mate or marry or whatever. Right. So I wanted there in the apocalypse world sense to be there, that room, if people wanted to sort of tell the story of, of, of people falling in love and expressing that love. But also, you know, what matters a lot more to me is, is that, that trigger cult, their culture trigger. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I really liked how that read when I was looking through the uh, document on that same sort of uh, thing about, you know, nuances that convey culture. The lifestyle section of the playbooks has uh, situations where the players are going to decide whether they spend gold on a certain thing and it gives them kind of a prescribed set of things that they would do to uh, make money. Would you like to discuss that any? Sure. Yeah. So lifestyle is one of those pretty close ports from Apocalypse World where in Apocalypse World, you have to pay one barter at the start of the game. And if you don't have barter, it lists a, a series of jobs. And the jobs are natural largely to the playbook. It's like, oh, yeah, that's what that person would do in that situation. Mm-hmm. But um, the economic aspect of this game is really important because humans, whether they're consciously you know, mustache-twirling oppressors or unaware and bowling, you know, destroying culture anyway, there is an economy in the game and the gold economy and the gold economy measures what humans value. So like you could be, for example, maybe you're an extraordinarily wealthy elf as far as elves are concerned, but you know, you only get three gold because you only have that roughly that much of what humans care about. And, and so a key feature in apocalypse world and in this game is scarcity. And, and this is even meaner than apocalypse world's lifestyle. Cause it's only ever one for apocalypse world. Whereas in a lot of these, it's like you could pay one and only take one harm, or uh, you can pay two. So that, that makes it even harder. And then what, what happens is the, a lot of these questions are super, super mean. <laughs> it's like, you know, or a lot of these job opportunities, like, um, uh, you know, for the elf, you can teach a, a hidden secret of magic to, you know, a demiurge character, or you can like appear as a curiosity at a party, you know? And the one of the options, as in almost everywhere in this game, one of the options is devise something on your own or devise something with the demiurge. Mm-hmm. So you're not locked into these degrading options, but I wanted the the playbooks to indicate what kinds of things humans thought you were good for. They're they're mostly negative. Some are nice. Some are some are about capability, but also largely capability from the human perspective. And it's even harder on some. So like the Elven Spark singer. The orcish warbander, the 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 trollish green ward, they're all negative. All of their their pre given job options are negative, and that's pointed. Like the spark singer, elves uh, have weariness. They they they're not long for this world. And every time something tragic happens, you mark a little petal on your flower of weariness, and 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 you come closer to going to the next world. Mm. So they're they're sort of under pressure in that way. Because they're they don't fit in this world anymore. The warbender, it's a lot more the orcish warbender. It's a lot more about like, well, we uh, fought a war and we 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 lost, and now we've got the, the. If any human knows about any non-human, it's an orc, and they're afraid of them, and and so they don't have a lot of what humans have to offer because their lives are hard right now. But the warbander, so like the the playbooks are not like. This is the elf. These are what elves are like. They're sort of two part names. So it's like the elvish spark singer is someone who sp- sings to the spark of the dying unreal and brings it back to life temporarily to mm-hmm. do some magic. So the, the warbander is a warrior protecting their tribe of non combatant orcs, who are twice as many as there are in the warband. And so the warbander doesn't need that much because that playbook is a warrior. Orcish culture is not necessarily a warrior culture you're playing somebody who is a warrior so to show how badass they are that you know it's like oh well i only need one gold but the uh, all of the job options are negative because it's things like well humans think you can kill people and and that you can steal things and like that's that's what happens and then the trollish green ward is like he's the closest uh, or they're the closest that, that i come to is like 
one of the things going in this game, in addition to cultural death, is it's sort of also about megafauna, you know, like environmental collapse, because Mm -hmm. part of why these people can't live anymore is the world is changing to not be a place where they can live. And, you know, like whenever I hear a story about a lion pack that kills a poacher, I'm like, those are orcs. (laughs) Because <laughs> they, they're they not going to – I'm very sad to say this. I don't think there's going to be a future with lots of lion packs. But those guys are like, well, I'm going to spit in your eye on my way down. Yeah. And, and, and the Green Ward is that. The Green Ward frequently suffers for being in civilization and, and finds things more difficult and, and a burning irritant and stuff. So they have especially bad outcomes as compared to like – uh, halflings and dwarves and gnomes who have things that humans value more. And then finally, the trader has it best off. The trader, who is the human who makes common cause with the, the non humans by living in the enclave and trying to keep it alive. So, like, as, it, as its name suggests, it, it, it's a trader. The, 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 a lot of the books are like presumed to be what humans would call them. So, like, the trader is a trader to humankind, but also potentially. It works two ways. It's a potentially a traitor to the enclave, and you could play it that way on purpose or by accident. So the humans, the human has eight gold at the start of play and only has to pay one at, at upkeep. And most of the jobs are, are, are either neutral with little consequence for him, but it's about you know maybe betraying the enclave or something, mm-hmm. or positive. Like they, There's very few playbooks that have it. Here's a job that makes things better. And the human has an option to like try and soothe things between humans and non-humans. And, and that's so unfair. And I want people to be like, why is this so easy for me? Like, the way that this works is if there's a trader in your group, by the second or third game, most people are going to be trying really hard, getting in dangerous situations and putting, them, their, putting their dignities on the line to get by. And the trader is going to be like, I got plenty of gold. Someone want me to, to, to pay, pay for them which is like a, a nice fun thing but also people are going to be looking at you like motherfucker yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah it, I, that's definitely something that came across there the um the the names and how all of the uh the economy works for each individual ones that was really strong for conveying the idea that I don't think anyone's going to read through this and if they're paying attention get the feeling that this is just a a standard high fantasy romp there is definitely more going on under the hood trying to get across a deeper message there and i i really appreciate that i'm glad that that comes across so well oh definitely and uh another thing that i noticed about that is um there's a couple of the playbooks that have a move where they can advise someone else and what i thought was really interesting about that is some of that advice is not good for it makes sense for the culture of the person giving the advice But if the person following the advice follows it, it may not work out well for them. And I thought that was really interesting. And I I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little. Yeah. So like I, I, I like the idea of offering another player advice, but I think the moves that do that in Apocalypse World can be tough on the person who takes the move because you have to wait around for someone to come to you and be like, uh, this is what I think you should do. And you're like, okay, great. I'm going to do that. Um, so instead, I think I, I know I have at least two. There's there's more than that probably. There's three advicey sort of moves that I can think of offhand. And one is for the the dwarf, where it's like the dwarf comes up to you and says, This is what you should do. And then you either take that or you don't. Um, but if the dwarf thinks that you're 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 doing right and you're doing the sorts of things you ought to do, then things will go go well for you. Whereas with the 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 but but also if it goes badly that's the one very specifically where the dwarf says well you've given good advice for for orcs i mean for dwarves that's that's no good for 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 the person that you gave advice to the gnomish inventor leans more on the inventor side in some ways although if you want to have gnomish culture be this way you could which is that i've got this crazy idea that's definitely going to cause chaos but i think it's going to (laughs) work and i think you should follow it and that's sort of like it's a different kind of imposition than the than the law than the dwarven lawgiver is giving because it's about like hey this is gonna go bad maybe and it, it has a different flavor but it's a similar kind of imposition whereas the human the the trader has as their required move everyone gets a free magic move and the human doesn't have a native magic move so instead mm-hmm. they have shut up and listen which says that if you you know take advice or if you ask advice 
of someone who isn't human on how to deal with a situation and, 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 and it costs you, it's going to mark experience, you know? So I, I think also because you can't, so like it's, it's important to say like, those are all each saying something about those cultures, but they're also goads to role playing. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you, once you have that move, you're going to be looking for a way to use it or to, you know, to have someone give you the advice if you're the human. And that's like, it's, it's a pushing people to interact. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and <laughs> I, let me just say, if, if someone reading that move for the uh, human picks up on the idea that maybe someone in a position of privilege should listen and there is a benefit to doing that, that would be a great thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I have to credit uh, Fred Hicks. He was at Dreamation watching me play. And he was like, I think this should be required because how do you get by in this enclave if you haven't learned how to listen? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and how can you be the hero of this enclave if you haven't learned to listen? And then, and I was like, you're right. And also the nice thing I liked about that is that before I was playing on the trope that humans have more flexibility Yeah, uh, and you know, humans can steal magic. That's how they get magic is if they've stolen it uh, or they've been taught it. But what I've done here is I've taken that flexibility away. Now they have just the same number of choices as everyone else, actually less because every playbook they're in the book, there's an additional magic move if you don't like the one that's in your playbook and, and the human doesn't have that or the trader doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I, I like I, this. The, the book is the game is unfair to the trader. It's 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 not a balanced game. Elves are better because that's, you know, a Tolkien thing. Elves are better. <laughs> and the, and it, the game is tough on the trader because even though it's easy in a lot of ways on the trader, it's mean. <laughs> the, the game yeah. is mean to the trader. <laughs> yeah, and and also to a certain extent, going back to you know the uh, going back to the lifestyle move, it's like think about why you're in a yep. better position. You started off yep. in a better position. Yeah, I actually had a player in a game say to me, you know, I, I've got this good option, and everyone else has so many bad options. Like, why is that? And I just kind of smiled at him. I was like, Yeah, you do. Like, oh. <laughs> um, one of the other things that I noticed, um, speaking of the dynamics in the, you know, in the enclave between the different people is that a lot of the relationship questions are very pointed. Like, it's not just, you know, this person and you had a great time with them. It's kind of like in several situations, it's almost leads to some uncomfortable connections between people. Yeah. The warbander has the one, like, how do I feel about how you killed my sister? And and that's probably the most pointed one, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to initially there was someone had suggested, well, what if it's just like beat her in a fight? And I was like, well, I what this says is that this is the kind of person who can have their sister killed and potentially be okay with a person, you know. And that so that's interesting to me because just beating someone in a fight is nowhere near as impactful as losing a family member, especially for a people who have so few people left, you know. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, I wanted to, it's kind of about scarcity again. So like the, 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 the company, which is the name for the group of, of characters in, in Demi-Humans, is closer than an, a, than an Apocalypse World PC group. because. So what it says in Apocalypse World is you, you may not be friends, but you know each other at the start of play. And then it goes from there. Yeah. Whereas this game says you may not be friends, but you know each other. And if you're playing this game, just like if you're playing Mouse Guard, you're choosing to play a member of the Mouse Guard. Mm -hmm. If you play this game, you're choosing to play someone who lives in this community and is trying to keep it alive. Now, you might have diametrically opposed ideas of what that means, but you still share that goal. And so the, 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 uh, since they're closer, I feel like I have to push harder to introduce that tension probably than Apocalypse World does mm -hmm. and make things a little spikier. But honestly, also, it's about oppression and scarcity, right? Like, so scarcity that I'm always trying to drive home is you don't necessarily have all good relationships with the people that you have to work with to keep this place going. Yeah. And, and oppression is oppressive systems split people. Like, maybe you're in your world, the orcs started out as, uh, way back when as relatively gentle people before the war and and now they've become the kind of people who can get over losing a sibling because of what the war what they choose to do in the war or maybe what was done to them or how how this person has reacted to it so yeah i, I want it to be about about how hard how hard it is when you're oppressed and don't have anything to get solidarity oh yeah definitely um 
And the the funny thing, every time you mention the Warbander, I noticed this, and I mentioned this when I emailed you before, but uh-huh. I have just finished watching uh, Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> and I noticed a few of the orc yeah. names kind of overlap a little bit there. And when you're talking about that, about, you know, not being able to pick your allies, it really reminded me of, yep. like, I did not like Lorel at the beginning of this. And Lorel becomes like one of the most sympathetic people, you know, in their as it progresses and you know that really reminded me of that point when you were discussing that yeah i'm watching uh the expanse now and in the third season there's this dynamic among the belters where like these people are like shooting at each other and then they're like best friends and like mm-hmm. it's it's really i like that 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 complexity a lot oh yeah definitely oh and i should also mention by the way that if you look closely at the playbooks there's all kinds of easter eggs for all sorts of geek media and then the names, especially. Yeah, and once you said that, I was thinking I need to go back through these. But <laughs> yeah. it was just because I had just been watching Discovery when I, when I got to the War Panda, I was like, "Oh, I see what he's doing here." <laughs> now, another thing that I noticed, and you were talking about the Enclave and trying to keep it alive, and the Enclave itself kind of has its own playbook. Did you want to uh, talk about that any? Yeah. So, like, uh, the Enclave has its own playbook. It's got its own flower instead of clocks in this game because that's anachronistic. It uses flowers that you darken the petals of. And so your enclave has a flower of human antipathy, Mm. uh, which uh, sort of, I'll just, as an aside, say, as I said before, the language in this is really flowery. And I might not have known the word antipathy if it were not for Mm D&D, old school (laughs) D&D, which is is kind of one of the, the ways that sort of thematically I'm trying to to be sort of I'm taking what I enjoyed about old D&D and, and using it essentially. Yeah. So that's why the language is as crazy as it is and includes things like effulgent as a main stat because not not just for like the Buffy the Vampire Slayer reference but also like <laughs> it's it, it's it, we have the internet now you can learn words and 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 it it also <laughs> captures sort of this faded elegance things are dying thing in the game. Yeah. But anyway, so the yeah, so the idea is you you're under threat, and so the threat is every session the demiurge is going to be pushing to try and make that flower of human antipathy wither, and, and that happens when the human authorities are like, oh, this is not good. We have to do something about about the enclave. Mm-hmm. And so basically, as I said before, it's taking those hard holder moves of like creating your hard hold, uh, 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 getting getting stuff out of it and stuff, and sort of folding it out to players and the way that i did that initially um so you know in the for the wealth roll for example in apocalypse world you roll and then you have some number of gold to spend and and i i had i mean a barter to spend in apocalypse world Mm -hmm. and i had for a while that it was gold and that players could say oh i'm i'm i have the money this time and i'm going to spend it either because things are happening behind the scenes uh, that just happened to work out that way and I'm not actually spending it or maybe my character is spending money actually as as part of their job on behalf of the Enclave. But it always didn't quite work. Mm-hmm. And so the, what I came up with instead is I was like, oh, each of these things will give you something roughly equivalent to one gold instead of giving you one gold. So like one of the options is you can have your lifestyle costs paid, you know, or yeah. you can go somewhere and get healed once this this game and so like at the start of each session you roll and you see the common wheel roll to see like what the state of the enclave is and what threats come after it. and actually that's one of the one of the hard things one of the hardest things in role playing is when you go from sitting down as people to pretending especially for that first session that that first moment of embodiment mm-hmm. so i want there to be as many signals as possible uh, for the demiurge uh, t- to know what to do, what to start with, and what to say next. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the having a hard holder when you're playing Apocalypse World is great because you always have those threats coming in, and and so now you always have those threats coming in unless people are lucky, and in which case you've got a lot of other things to look at too, like gnosis questions and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it, it's it, another thing that I like about it is that it gets the table to create the, the, the town that they're in and, and to invest in it. And then, and then what it does at the other end is a really fun tension, which is that the game ends if the enclave does, flower dies and you can give up your personal uh, improvements that you would ordinarily get from XP and instead spend them on the enclave. The, the, the trader can only do it once, but all the non-human uh, characters 
can improve the enclave. They could, you could have never spent a single improvement on yourself and only mm -hmm. uh, improve the enclave uh, if that's what you want. And I'm really curious to see how hard people are going to fight for that and what they'll give up to do that. And, and I hope, hopefully it's interesting. And what's, what's interesting to me is I, a lot of um, PBTA games that I run, I will run as one shots or short arcs. And that really makes me want to see how that progresses over time. Yeah. Like, are you willing? I, I tried to make the playbooks have so many great moves that you, no matter what, and I've heard it over and over again, they're like, oh, I, I really want that other move. Damn it. <laughs> and so to have that feeling and then to also be like, well, you know, the enclaves in real bad straits. We got like, you know, cops on every corner. You know, you could maybe if you spent a thing on that, then they'll be calm enough to go back home and, and, and let you breathe a little. And I'm really curious to see if people will do it. It's really a fun idea. Mm -hmm. So just because I'm kind of curious about this, can you describe your favorite agendas and principles in the game and why you included them? So, like, uh, my favorite agenda is probably play to find out what happens because, you know, that seems to me that's kind of the only way I can play. And one of the <laughs> things that I did with this game is I tried to push that even further and to say, you know, don't prepare any. There's no fronts. You know, there, there are threats. But the, 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 all you need to do for a threat is come up with a name and a primary impulse, and that's it. You mm -hmm. don't need to, like, categorize it or anything. There's, there are other things you can add to threats if you want to to embroider them. but I want this to be a pick up and play game for every session you play. Mm -hmm. So that's that I'm really leaning into that. The principles, uh, one of the ones I really like is look for a third side again with this expanse. Well, you know, let me give a bigger example Fur Mad Max Fury Road, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the scene where Furiosa, Max and the war boy are all fighting and they're all on their own side. Like I was like, ah, oh, that's gotta be in the game. And the, and, and, <laughs> And putting a third side in to almost any situation makes it so much more interesting. And, and especially when it comes to, you know, keeping a, a, a town alive, like that's real. You, there's never just two sides when you're dealing with something as big as a, as a community. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and so I think, I hope that'll bring some verisimilitude. Another one I like a lot uh, sort of tries to address an issue I've had with a lot of PBTA play, which is abandon no one. And so Abandoned No One is sort of a two-part thing. One is that this is a difficult game. It's about, you know, genocide and stuff and mm -hmm. environmental collapse. And, and so take care of each other. Don't abandon anyone when you go to somewhere terrible. But also don't abandon the characters. Spotlight is an issue in my experience in PBTA games. And, and to be fair, it's an issue in almost all role-playing games. It's, it's mm -hmm. like highly reliant on the, the GM-like figure to be a good person and, and be good at that skill. And, yeah. and to be fair, I mean, I have the abandoned no one principle and I explain to you how to, how to make sure that no one gets abandoned, but it's not as robust as like primetime adventures where like, okay, this episode, I'm a three. That means I'm the star. This episode, I'm a two. That means that uh, I I'm important, but I'm not the star or I'm an antithesis. I, I I'm a one. I'll only be in a few scenes. I don't get a lot of lines. And I really think I, it, I didn't want to throw more cruft onto a PBTA game that was relatively complicated already, but I feel like I want a lot more of that. I want, I want role-playing games to take into account that people sit around bored uh, more often. Yeah. But the most important one to me probably is make violence ugly. And so the idea with this is not necessarily make violence bloody. It's an agnostic toward that. Maybe you're into gore or you're not. That's fine. But Violence is not a solution. Uh, you can't tap someone on the head and make them go unconscious. You're causing traumatic brain injury. You know, yeah. when you hurt someone, <laughs> the people that, even if you're successful, you know, that's going to affect other people. It's going to affect you. So as much as I can, and there's a, there's a, a, a reaction, which is the MC move name. That's what we call MC moves in this game called revisit past violence as well. And I want, uh, the game is a violent game. Every playbook gets, weapons you know or has access to it mm -hmm. if they want it so i want there to be this tension between like you're oppressed and violence helps deal with oppression and scarcity means that you need to 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 be violent sometimes but it's a consequence and i think rooting it in a place it's about like stopping murder ho hoboism to an extent you know yeah. and rooting it in a place does that too you can't 
walk away from the consequences of the people you kill. Yeah, definitely. So I think we're going to uh, wrap us up and start heading towards our final questions. Uh, where can people get more information about your game? Demihumans.com. Can you believe it? That was not <laughs> I just got that last wow. week. After all these decades of uh, gaming, and that's still, uh, that was still out there. I had there. to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now that redirects to the evilhat.com slash Demihumans site, which is where mm-hmm. you can go to sign up for, well, when is this going to come out? This will probably be our first gnome cast in the next year. Okay, so playtests will have closed by then, probably. Uh, uh, but uh, that's where you can see like a description of the game. You can see all of the, the history of the world handouts, playbooks, uh, demiurge reference material, enclave creation and rules, and probably I know all the interviews and stuff that that we do will go up there. So until and unless I make my own website, Eagle Hat has to be covered in a beautiful way. <laughs> honestly i was pretty excited when i saw the announcement because i had seen you discussing this game for a while but i was really happy to see that uh this is going to be in collaboration with evil hat yeah me too i've known fred fred gave me the idea for the name for misspent youth i've like known him since before i was a designer and 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 he played in one of the first games of misspent youth ever and and helped me make it not suck so uh, and 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 what Evil Hat has done is so extraordinary. Like they 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 pay people, they pay people on time. They uh, uh, they're extremely well organized. Uh, they you know I'm I've got ADD, and and one of my things is if someone isn't standing there tapping their foot looking at me, I don't get any work done. But if they are, I am on fire. So like I, it, it's just the level of of professionalism and and smartness. And and they're there for me. It's I'm just really really happy. Yeah, yeah. I was I was definitely uh, happy to see that as a as a development there. So when do you think the game's going to be available in its final form? So it's too early to say officially. I'm hoping next year, but that's that's not 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 official. Right. I'm going to do my best to make that happen. All right. And um, if people wanted to get a hold of you particularly, where would they be able to find you online? I'm on uh, Twitter at Robert Bowl B O H L. I'm also at Facebook, facebook.com slash Robert Bowl. I have robertbowl.com, misspentyouthgame.com, or misspentyouth.robertbowl.com. Also, uh, robertbowl.com is actually, right now, it's a bunch of blog entries from when I was working on earlier stages of Demi Humans. I'll probably put more up there at some point. So, yeah. Awesome. And uh, do you have any uh, last words you want to share with the Gnomecast listeners? Uh, no, other than to say thanks a lot for listening. And, uh, you know, it's it's the Gnomecast. So if someone plays a Gnomish inventor out there and makes a fantasy podcast out of it, I want to hear about that. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you so much for coming on here. I've had a great time talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Oh, it's been quite a, quite a pleasure. I'll, I'll need to write more games so I can talk to you more. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so thanks. much. Have a good day. This show funded by the Gnome Stew Patreon. You too can become a Patreon backer by following the Patreon link on the Gnome Stew website to the Gnome Stew Patreon. This ad brought to you by Cosmic Consequence Dice. It's not that they don't roll poorly, it's they are attuned to the cosmic balance of the universe, and when they roll bad, it's because you deserve it. You know what you did. If you are enjoying the Gnomecast, you'll probably like many of the other Misdirected Mark shows. Here's one to check out. Bonus experience, Ray and Monica are two old friends exploring gameplay and design through the lens of diversity, while also sharing some of the dumbest humor gaming has to offer. Gnomecast is hosted by Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs.